Good. All right. Um, my name is Jeff Enders. I'm a PT. I'm here to talk to you guys about physical therapy today. So, um, has anybody here had therapy ever? Yeah? A few? Cool. All right. So, just quick uh, question more so. Um, what do you, when you think of therapy, if you haven't had therapy before, like what comes to mind? Is it like a, a guy in a white coat roaming through the, the halls of a hospital or is it, you know, something you get at a nursing home? Is it something you go to an outpatient place for? What do you, what do you think of? I think of Anyone, uh, yeah. Southeast uh, Health Point where my wife did her therapy, which is also the same place that is our gym. It's like right next yeah. to that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's one. That's one setting, um, and I'll get into this a little bit more. But you know, I think a lot of people they know a little bit about therapy, but there's there's really a lot that you can do. Um, different settings you can work in, different types of patients, different types of people, um, all those different things. So um, that's that's the pretty common one that most people know about. But there's a few other things too. So. Um, all right, you can go ahead and skip to the next slide. So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself first, and then we'll move on. Um, so I'm a Jackson grad. I actually had Mr. Helly for anatomy a long, long time ago. Um, have you guys taken anatomy? Are you in anatomy now? Hands, can you raise them up? You guys are in anatomy, okay? So there's a, you're going to learn a lot of good stuff. If you have any interest in healthcare at all, anatomy is a great a great place to start because um, it'll be relevant to you almost no matter what field you go into. So um, I graduated Jackson in 2006, then I went to Maryville. It's in Chesterfield, Missouri. So I did my bachelor's there, graduated in 2010, and then I went on in my therapy degree there as well. So um, right now in Missouri, yeah, in Missouri and really nationwide, you have to have a doctorate degree degree to become a therapist, so that's where I did my doctorate degree through Maryville. So Was it always that way? It, it hasn't always been that way. So it started as a bachelor's many, many moons ago, and then it went to a master's, and then it's progressed to a doctorate. And so one of the main reasons it's progressed to a doctorate is because just recently in Missouri, um, they passed this law, it's called direct access, to where anybody can come in off the street without a doctor's prescription and get physical therapy. And so we have to be... How long ago was that? Uh, August. I was like, yes, that was not a thing. Right. So before that, you had to have a doctor's prescription. And so the reason for the, like, kind of moving it to a doctorate program is because we have to be uh, pretty good at teasing out, you know, is this, a, is this a therapy issue or is this a medical issue or is this something that you need to go see somebody else for? So that's the reason, like, the evolution of the education and the length and the coursework Doc, can I ask you a question? Sure. How do you feel about that change? So, I like it, um, and I'll tell you there's, um, in therapy, there you've got people who have been a therapist for 30 years and have a bachelor's degree, so they got a four-year therapy degree. They're not real comfortable with it because they didn't get kind of the differential diagnosis, they didn't get the courses on how to read images or like when you might need an image. So like, for me, I went through the, you know, we had imaging classes, we had differential diagnosis classes, which, uh, do you guys know what differential diagnosis is? No? Have you guys ever seen the show House? All right, so House, if you've seen House, House is like a, if he was real, he would be like a master at the differential diagnosis world. So differential diagnosis is basically where you come in and you tell me your shoulder hurts, and then I've got to figure out why does your shoulder hurt? Is it your shoulder? Is it your neck? Is it your heart? Is it your lung? That's differential diagnosis. So you kind of go through the different signs and symptoms, the way the symptoms behave, and it kind of leads you towards, you know, down, down a path. So um, I feel pretty comfortable with that as far as kind of figuring those sorts of things out. Um, but I, you know, I went through the course, the coursework, um, so you'll find you'll find people who who have varying degrees of comfort or discomfort. With and that's different state by state, isn't it? Like yeah. As far as yes, if you have to have a prescription. Because I was talking to so my wife's therapist was a traveling PT. Yeah. Uh, uh, <coughs> you, you probably know him, but uh, he he I think he's in Columbia now. But he 
traveled to okay. the, yeah. Uh, but he said he said that different states have different different laws about that. Yeah. Like, yeah. So Missouri actually is one of the last ones to get direct access. And so there were 47 other states who had it before us. So now I think there's Illinois is one, and I forget the last one that doesn't have direct access. So the push to a doctorate degree actually came from kind of like a national level because across the board, the American Physical Therapy Association saw that that's where things were going. Uh, there's been a big push towards therapy with all like the, the op opioid epidemic and trying to move away from medication and looking for alternative ways to uh, relieve pain. And so um, the accrediting bodies for therapy schools go through the APTA or the American Physical Therapy Association. And so that's where the push started was, was kind of on a national level. It just took Missouri a little while to get it through like the, the legislature, so. Wow. I was going to ask, what was the push that made them decide to go this way? But it sounds like the push was the pressure that almost every other state yeah. in the union does. Yeah, and, and one thing that helped Missouri push it through is that, you know, it's 47 other states have had it, and there haven't really been any issues as far as, like, a PT missing something <coughs> and it, you know, turn into, like, a catastrophic health issue. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's not pretty safe. It's really safe. Um, it's cost effective. It, it, you look at outcomes, and um, one thing that gets the legislators to, to move and shake is when you start talking about money, right? And so um, it's shown to, to cut down cost, cost of health care. So um, that was another big, big driver for it. So, okay. all right, so then you, you all probably gather, but I'm a physical therapist, and I am the rehab manager at our. Health Point location in Jackson, just down the road here. So um, I graduated school. I worked for about six years just as like a regular staff therapist. I saw patients all day, every day. Um, so now I still see patients, but I also do a little bit of kind of like mentoring for other therapists, um, <coughs> kind of some back end, like administrative things, making sure we follow the rules and regulations. We, you know, there's, there's, because we're part of a hospital system, we have to follow what I'll call hospital rules. And so there's a little bit more um, strict expectation as far as like how we clean things and how often we clean things and how we keep um, patients' information safe. Like if you guys have ever heard of HIPAA, it's basically a law that you know, you've got to protect patients' information. So things like that, I've also kind of moved into doing some of that too. So, good. All right, you can go ahead to the next slide. So what I want to cover today is kind of these, these little bullets here. So kind of tell you about what is therapy. I assume you all, if you're interested in any sort of health profession, like you have the question of how do I get into therapy school or how do I get into nursing school or how do I get into med school. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about the therapy side, um, what you learn in school, how long it takes to get your degree, and then kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, if you were to become a therapist, what you might do. So. All right, you can go to the next slide. So in a nutshell, um, this is kind of the, the Google definition. If you look up therapy, this is what it's going to tell you, what a therapist's purpose is, um, what we do. So what I tell people is we're kind of experts in, in movement, and we're experts in how everything works together. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to know this bone and this muscle and that ligament and that tendon. Um, but kind of what we do is we take all that and we see how, like how do they work together? You know, you tell us kind of what's going on and we take all those things that we know and we kind of try to figure out what's a plan uh, or even back up one step, what's the problem and then what's the plan to fix it? And so one of my favorite things is you guys heard that song, like your knee bones connected to your shin bone. Yeah, that one? Okay, so that's a therapist. So, you know, um, you might have somebody that comes in with pain in their leg that's coming from their back. Or you might have somebody that comes in with a numb hand and it's coming from their neck or maybe from their elbow, you know, sort of thing. And so that's what, that's the cool part about what we do is we get to put the puzzle together and kind of, you know, piece by piece and kind of figure out what's going on. Um, so to do that, basically, there's... You know, there's things that we can look at. We can look at range of motion and strength, and we can do different tests. We can check your balance. We take our, our knowledge of anatomy and physiology and um, not only normal anatomy, but abnormal, 
abnormal anatomy and kind of how do things behave when this happens or that happens. And then we kind of figure out, okay, this is what we think is going on, and then that's, that's when we go to work. That's when we, we will work to try to fix whatever's going on. So any questions about that? Nope? Good? All right, you can go on to the next slide. Okay, anybody here considering therapy? PT? OT? Occupational therapy? Speech therapy? Oh, we're a very quiet yeah. club. We're, we're <laughs> counting on you to get that. Cool. All right. So um, I'll, tell, I'll speak to you kind of like what HealthPoint has from the, from the, therapy, the therapy realm. So um, we have physical therapy, we have occupational therapy, we have speech therapy. So I'll start with speech therapy. Um, a speech therapist, you know, it, everybody thinks of them kind of as they work with little kids who can't say the word R or they don't know, you know, they stutter or things like that. But there's really a lot more that a speech therapist will do. Um, they have a lot of training on swallowing, um, a lot of training on like some co cognitive things. So if people have, um, like for example, if you have a stroke, you can have some word finding issues. And so they'll teach people kind of strategies to get around word finding issues or how to speak properly or things like that. Um, probably, I think one of the most important things a speech therapist might do is, is folks who have a, like a hard time swallowing. Um, you guys heard of pneumonia? Yeah? Okay, so have you heard of the word aspiration? You know what it means? No? Okay. So, you breathe your food, basically. Yeah, so there's this term called aspiration pneumonia. So basically, if you can't swallow appropriately, sometimes the, you know, you swallow and what should go to your stomach goes to your lungs. It gets infected. Pneumonia can be a life-threatening thing. And so um, they'll work with people on swallowing. Um, so that's one thing a speech therapist can do. An occupational therapist is, their main focus is on kind of what we'll call activities of daily living. So helping people, could be anything from tying their shoes, cooking, bathing, showering, um, anything. They do a little bit more of what we'll call fine motor. So like things with your fingers and hands um, that you need a little bit more dexterity. So I have a friend that had a stroke and basically had to relearn how to do everything. Yeah. Instead of starting with this spoon that had this giant Yeah, on yep, it. big handle. So like, would, that, would be an OT be the person that Absolutely. helped them do yeah. that? Yes. And so, um, you know, an, an OT is going to work probably a little bit more with people who have had like a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, um, spinal cord injuries, those sorts of things. Um, and PTs have a role in that too, but um, generally people think of PT as kind of what we'll call a gross motor profession. And OT is a little bit more what you call a fine motor profession. So it might be things like handwriting. It might be opening a jar, it might be eating, brushing your teeth, um, that sort of thing. Um, but there is a little bit of carryover too. So, and then finally we'll get to PT, so that's what I do. So PT um, will work with everything from strengthening to balance to um, conditioning. Um, so this is kind of where a little bit like the different settings I was going to tell you about you can get into. So. Um, I'll loop back around to that. So to get into therapy school, um, there's kind of two paths you can take. And so some schools do what's called direct entry. Other schools do just kind of like a traditional grad school. So Maryville, where I went, was a direct entry program. So basically what that means is you apply to their program as a high school senior, and you go through their process, um, and they will conditionally admit you to their grad school if you do undergrad there. So you do your first four years there, you meet certain benchmarks along the way, you're guaranteed a spot in their therapy school when you're done. That's really great for um, people who know what they want to do, where they want to go, people who've got to have a plan. Um, the downside to that is typically it's at, it's at the private schools, so it's a little bit more expensive to do it that way. But you, I mean, you're locked in, you know where you're going when you're doing it. Um, the flip side is you have the, just the traditional grad school model to where you go, you get a four-year undergrad degree, and then you apply to therapy school. Okay, so you can do your four years wherever you want. 
you know, you can do it at SEMO, you could do it at Mizzou, you could do it at Wash U, you could do it at Maryville, however you want to do. And then you apply to a different school. So one other thing I forgot to mention about the direct entry route is it actually shaves a little time off. So you can get done about six months to a year sooner if you do direct entry versus the traditional grad school. Um, the other piece to that is sometimes people will go four years and apply to a therapy school and they don't get in their first year. And so then they have this, what you know, what you call a gap year. So if you, if you consider therapy and you want to go this route, um, I would kind of encourage you to have a backup plan just in case you don't get into the school you want the first year on what you're going to do um, in that, that one year. Yeah. How do they, like, what is your undergrad? <coughs> So at, at Maryville, my undergrad is in health science. Um, it's basically was just like a well-rounded, you know, anatomy, uh, physiology, exercise science kind of. I would say it, was, it would be a good degree, like you could be a personal trainer. You could be um, kind of like a health, not like, I'm not going to say health expert, but somebody just, you know, a little bit about a lot of, a lot of aspects of health. Um, but some people go in with athletic training degrees. Um, but really, for the traditional um, grad school program, you could have, I mean, you could even have a business degree, you know. So it probably helps you if you have a little bit more of like a health or a, a science-related degree. So some people will do biomedical science. Some people will do athletic training. Um, some people will do psychology. Some people will do health science. Um, that sort of thing. Do an MCAT or a GRE or? No, nope, no. Nope. So there's no, there is no, like MCAT's just for the med for medical school. So there's nothing like that therapy related. Some of these traditional grad school programs, they will require a GRE. Um, but like Maryville, where I went, they didn't. It's basically, it's, um, you almost get admitted as a, you do kind of as a freshman, but it's, you know, it's a lot of, ACT score, high school GPA. Um, I'll get into this again later, but there's a whole process. Like you apply and you interview and you write an essay. And, um, part of your, um, whether you get in or not, depends on like how do you talk to people and how do you, uh, how do you kind of present yourself in an interview too. So, good? Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing that I'll tell you is um, like with this, I'm going to go back to the direct entry. Um, route. So the thing about the thing about that is it puts you you're at an advantage if you commit to therapy school like right out of high school if you're going to go this route because there are some people that I went to school with that they went um, they got a four year degree and they applied to Maryville's therapy program and they got in but they didn't get into the fifth year they got into the second year. So they did four years, and then they come back, and so they got to do the second year, the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year, the sixth year. So it took them nine years to get that degree that it took me to six to get. So you can apply, like you can, you can get into a direct entry program with a bachelor's degree, but it's not going to be as fast. So the other thing is, if you go a different route, um, I would I would make sure that you commit and go to where you want to go um, because as you start transferring between programs you lose some like you lose some of your credits like you got to repeat things because they want you to take take anatomy or physiology or whatever in their program so it'll come over as an elective but it won't come over as like a core class so. all right oh here we go so I did get this so um, I would suggest for high school you know what do you like what kind of classes do you need to take if you want to go any therapy route. So um, I think generally you need to be well-rounded. You need to know a little math. You need to know how to write. You need to know how to speak. You need to know science. Um, I think it would be very beneficial if you were pretty strong in biology and uh, chemistry and physics and anatomy, like those sorts of courses. The, that's what you're going to take when you get to school, like to college, to therapy school or wherever you decide to go. Um, and it's going to put you just, like it's going to be so a lot of it's going to be new, but you're going to go over some of it that it's, it's going to be more like a review for you. So um, I feel like the anatomy class I took in high school, I took, um, in therapy school, you take different, different levels of anatomy. So you'll take basic anatomy, and you take gross anatomy, and you take neuroanatomy. And so 
my basic anatomy class in undergrad, probably what I learned in the first year at Maryville, i oh, sorry, what I learned in the first semester at Maryville was about what I learned my first year here. So like my first semester of anatomy was mostly review. You know, there were some new things sprinkled in there, but um, that just helps you kind of get get ahead. You know, you, you've already been exposed to it. Even if you don't remember it necessarily off the top of your head, when they start going over it again, you'll remember it again and it, it'll definitely help you in that class. So, um, and then this is what I was talking about, kind of the, the process to get in. So, um, at Maryville, you had to fill out an application and you had to do, I had to do 20 observation hours with a therapist. And so now that, that requirement's a little bit higher um, as far as the number of hours. But basically, I had to follow a therapist and kind of, you know, see what they did. So I followed a therapist at an outpatient setting, which is kind of like where I work and what Mr. Kelly was describing. Um, I followed a therapist in the hospital, so I, I went around and saw, I didn't see any patients, but I got to watch. Um, and I did a little bit in a nursing home. So, and that actually, I didn't, I didn't intend to do it that way, but it served me well because part of the, um, the interview process is you interview and you write an essay. And so the essay question basically asked you, at least mine, asked me about what I saw when I did my observation hours and what, you know, did that make me want to be a therapist or not be a therapist or did I like this and not that. And so having been exposed to, you know, several of the different settings, um, it served me well. So it was, it was kind of one of those things that it fell in. It just worked out that way, but it was, it was good. So, any questions about therapy school? How to get in? No? All right, you can go to the next slide. All right, so this is kind of what you learn in therapy. What I wanted to, what I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about on this slide is um, the therapy program, like once you're in the actual therapy part of it, so not the undergrad, you know, when you're going for your, for your uh, graduate degree, um, you don't have a whole lot of choice in what you take. You know, it's kind of mapped out, like you need to take this in this semester, this in this semester, this in this semester, because all your courses, they kind of build on each other. And so you go in and you pretty much, they have this degree planning sheet to where you know what you're going to take which semester, how many hours you're going to have each semester. So that piece of it is nice that you don't have to kind of hunt and peck and try to figure out exactly what you need and when you need it. So, um, but early on, so like when you're in your undergrad, so it's, it's just kind of general courses. Um, it's everything from basic math to basic writing, um, a little bit of history, like just kind of making sure you're well-rounded. So um, I'll tell you, like I don't do, like I don't write research papers, but I write all the time. So like I write notes, I send communication to doctors, um, back and forth just with people that I work with and so you know if I by no means could like write a book with you know pic picture-perfect grammar but um, you know that's kind of what the early years are for just you need to be able to communicate you need to know basic math science those sorts of things so then as you progress in the program it, it your courses become a little bit more therapy specific and so it goes from you know when you're in like your your undergrad, you'll have anatomy. So that's kind of similar to like what Mr. Helly would teach. It's just basic anatomy, you learn on models, you learn on diagrams, you learn on, you know, maybe some interactive kind of computer type stuff. Um, but as you progress, then you go, you start to learn what I'm going to call normal anatomy. So um, you guys know what gross anatomy is? No? Okay. Uh, anybody been on the field trip to the cadaver lab? We're going in December. Anybody going to go? All right, so gross anatomy is you, that's where you get to dissect a cadaver. So part of therapy school is I've dissected a cadaver. Um, it kind of seems weird at first, but like as you get to learn about it, it, it's really cool. You get to learn a lot, you get to see things. And so um, you take gross anatomy, so that's, that, that's a lecture in a lab. So it's a really intense anatomy class. You learn a lot of a lot of details so you know we do the things like there's models and there's pictures like you have on the wall there's the textbook and then the lab component is you take everything you've learned and you go identify it on a cadaver so you do the dissections um, you know you the cool thing about gross I'm gonna call it gross um, 
is that you do the dissection and so everybody like you learn normal anatomy right so in the in the textbooks everything is it's picture perfect every time you peel this layer back this is what's next this nerve is here this artery is here okay so when you when you do gross anatomy you'll find that there's variation in normal anatomy so you know if you're um, there's a nerve called your your ulnar nerve right it runs back here along your elbow okay so in the textbooks it's right here every time well sometimes it's shifted a little bit um, and so those are the cool things you get to see in gross anatomy and that you might see in the cadaver lab um, you get to see kind of the, the variations you might get to see some abnormal anatomy um, so you know abnormal anatomy would be more of kind of like your congenital deformities or changes you know like some people have there's a heart condition they can be born with it's called transposition of the great vessels where you know the artery that's supposed to be here is here and the veins are here you know um, you get to see those sorts of things so um, so you do gross anatomy do neuroanatomy anybody if I say neuroanatomy what do you think brain, brain spinal cord yep peripheral nerves have you heard of that no okay so brain and spinal cord and then as nerves come off of the spinal cord you know have you heard of like your ulnar nerve or your median nerve your sciatic nerve those are peripheral nerves so they've come off of the spinal cord they form different branches along the way um, and you'll get like your your sciatic nerve is one that most people know um, you learn musculoskeletal anatomy so that's muscles bones tendons ligaments and you learn cardiopulmonary so that's one of the probably the coolest classes that I think you'll ever take because the heart and lung and the vasculature is like it's really detailed but it's also it's kind of one of those courses where everything just makes sense you know you can see how this artery you know winds through your body and it eventually turns into a vein and takes things back and forth you can see arteries and veins leave your heart and go to your lungs and come back to your heart and all those things so um, I don't, on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't do cardiopulmonary therapy, but there is such a thing, and, and that's kind of where you learn a lot of that. So, do you guys know what physiology is? No? There's a few of them that should. Yeah, all right. So, anatomy is muscles, bone, it's like structures, right? So, physiology is kind of how things work together. Um, so, you learn a lot of physiology. Um, that's a little bit more important to... Like if you were to work in a hospital, you know, you're working with patients that are a little bit like more medically sick or medically unstable. You got to know a lot of a lot of physiology. And then you get, you know, as you progress, you get to abnormal anatomy. So you kind of take all those courses over again. But it's like, OK, if I'm going to take neuroanatomy, what's everything that could go wrong? That's abnormal neuroanatomy. Or you'd say I'm going to take abnormal. They call it orthopedic anatomy so like abnormal orthopedic anatomy what's everything that could go wrong you learn about those things um, same thing cardiopulmonary and that's where this congenital versus acquired so like in anatomy a congenital issue like you're born with it right so like some people would be born um, you know with say they don't have they don't have anything below like right here okay so that would be a congenital issue. If they got in a car wreck and had to amputate, that would be an acquired issue. The, the end result is the same thing, but how you got it is a little different. So, um, and then this is what I was talking about earlier, the medical screening piece of things. And so that's really important to the direct access. And kind of what you have, like what you learn in that is um, different issues, like they have pretty classic ways that they behave. And so when someone is sitting in front of me and describing to me, you know, whatever their issue is, maybe their back hurts, you know, you, you kind of start to think to yourself, okay, is this normal? Does this sound like, does this behave like anything that we've learned about? And if it does, then you treat it. And if not, then you send it on, you know, maybe to a doctor or for um, therapists can't order any imaging or anything, but that would be something that, that a physician would have to order. That seems frustrating. Yeah, so we can't order them, but we can look at them. Look at them and read them. So if I think someone needs an x-ray, I've got to send them on to their doctor. So like, for example, if you came to me and said, hey, my neck hurts. I was, it's Monday morning. You come to me and say, hey, my neck hurts. I was in a car accident over the weekend. Should I work on you or no? Uh, car accident. 
next to it. I'm going to go with a no. No, because that's a trauma, right? So they could have like a vertebral fracture or something. Um, and if you have a vertebral fracture and I'm working on you and I injure your spinal cord, that's a big deal, right? So I should send that out for an x-ray at the very least, you know, let somebody medically clear them. So uh, you learn a little bit of research. And so um, part of Maryville's program is you have to do a research project. It's over the span of about two years. It's not two years steady. It's one class a semester for two years. And so you're working on this project a little bit at a time. Um, and so that's like, it's cool to see the process, but what I take more out of it on my day-to-day -day job is how to read research. You know, I don't, I don't work in an academic institute, so I don't research, but I need to be able to read articles and things that come out so I can know, hey, I need to start doing that, or I need to stop doing this sort of thing. And then the last thing you do is, is clinical rotations. And so I kind of equate that to like student teaching. So you go out, you work under a therapist for a period of time, you know, usually about six months. You just kind of learn in the ropes in real time. So in school, when you learn these things and you practice different techniques, you're practicing on your classmates who, one, don't have issues, but two, they know what you're trying to do. And so it's a little bit, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, it's a test, but it's not the same as real life. And so that's what your clinical rotations are for. So. All right, you can go on to the next slide, please. <laughs> All right, so therapy school, probably you're looking at six to seven years. And so that includes undergrad all the way through the completion of your graduate degree. So direct entry, like I did, that's about as fast as you can get done at six years. If you do four years of undergrad and then apply to a therapy school, therapy school is about three, so you're going to be looking more like seven. So one way direct access, or sorry, direct entry cuts down some time is you actually get credit for some some of the courses you're doing in your undergrad actually count towards your requirements for grad school and so that just cuts off a little bit of a little bit of time there so it's about six to seven years of school you go on clinicals for six to nine months um, that's what I was talking about it's kind of like student teaching so then you graduate and then you get to take this big test the biggest test you'll ever take in your life if you want to be a therapist and so it's the board exam, and it's where um, if you pass it, you get a license. If you don't, then you don't get a license. You can't be a therapist without a license. So it's the biggest test. It's the most important test. And it's one, um, they can ask you any question about anything that you ever should have learned. So if one of your professors in college skipped over something and forgot to teach you, doesn't matter, you're supposed to know it. So you gotta be able to know it for the test. And so it could be anything from basic anatomy questions, um, things all the way down to like a cellular level, biology questions all the way up to like higher level, you know, how do you do a joint mobilization on a shoulder type thing. Um, and you know, there's other things like, you gotta know CPR, so like they might ask you some questions about CPR or the Heimlich maneuver or, or those sorts of things too. So anything you should know as a therapist is fair game for that test. All right, you can go ahead, Juan. All right, so in therapy, you can work at an outpatient place, kind of like I work at. You can work at a hospital. You can work at a nursing home. You could work at a school. You could work... Um, there's a setting called home health where you basically go to people's houses and do therapy, like people who can't get out. Um, that's, that's a pretty common one, like if people have had a surgery. So you might go to their house and do therapy on them for a couple of weeks. So Most PTs who work full-time, they work eight or ten hour days. So eight hour days, you're going to work five days a week. Ten hour days, you work four days a week. So I do a four ten hour day schedule. Um, as you get older and get on with life, it's kind of convenient to have a day off during the week, and so that's pretty attractive to a lot of therapists. Um, like I said, here's the settings that you can work in. So, like when we do patient care, so the first time a new patient comes to us, we usually spend about an hour with them, and that's where we're kind of trying to get to know what's going on, when did it start, um, kind of what have you done up to this point, and trying to figure out what's the problem and how do you fix it, okay? 
So then after that, when you come back for treatments, you don't have to do that kind of first time get to know you piece. And so we're usually working with people for about 30 to 45 minutes, and that's one on one. And so, you know, a piece of that is kind of how have you been doing, you do your workout, um, see how you did kind of, and then you formulate a plan on, in your mind as far as like, okay, what do I want to do next time? What do I need to change? What do I need to keep the same? And so probably I think the best part of being a therapist is at the end of the day, you're there to help people. And so you not only help them physically, you know, you help them get better, you help them to hurt less, but you spend a lot of time, you get to know them. So you kind of help them emotionally, uh, <coughs> mentally. What I think therapists do a lot but don't really get credit for per se is there's a lot of times where, you know, people come to us and they've had surgery, and so they're going through probably one of the hardest times physically of their life. And so we're with them the whole way. You know, we're, we're with them when it hurts. We're with them at the last day when they walk out of there smiling, everything in between, the good days, the bad days. So that's probably, that's a really cool part of our job is that we just get to know people, we get to help people, um, and, you know, everything in between. So, all right, you can go to the next slide. Oh, all right. Questions? Yep. How do you like your new role versus when you were in like, 18 most of the time? Yeah. So I like it. It's a little different. Um, you know, I kind of felt like I had got to the point to where in the outpatient setting, like, I'm not going to say I had seen it all, but like, I felt like I was pretty good at figuring out stuff, you know, whatever it was. You came in, I could figure it out, I could get you better. Um, taking on my new role was kind of, for me, it was a new challenge um, because I still do patient care, so I still get that, you know, everybody goes to therapy school to try to help people, and so I still get to do that, but um, a cool piece of my new job is I get, I, I get to help others help people, and I also get, you know, kind of to play a role in how does, how does Health Point do therapy? Uh, making sure that we stay up on the latest and greatest technologies, on the techniques, um, you know, and just kind of, kind of, teaching the teachers kind of thing. So, I like that piece of it. So, I like it. It's a, it's a different challenge, but it's um, it's a challenge. So, did you enjoy your classes in your program at, at Maryville? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, and you know, I think everybody. Everybody's got like a different, um, like a different class or a different, you know, subset of classes. So like your neuro classes or your orthopedic classes or your cardiopulmonary classes that you gravitate to some, like you enjoy some more than others. Um, for me, I always did the best with the ones that like I could physically see, that I could physically put my hands on models. Um, the, the most difficult ones for me were the, the neuro courses or so like the brain and spinal cord courses, right? Like, you know, I could, I could practice testing somebody's shoulder strength all day long because I'd just get a classmate and we'd go do it. But when I had to look at the diagram of like the brain or spinal cord, um, that was tougher for me. And as you, uh, do you learn, like do you teach any neuro? Yeah, in your, but like the second semester is mostly. Okay, different. so when you learn neuro, you'll learn that like there's a whole lot more to it than just like your brain and spinal cord, right? So there's through your spinal cord and your brain stem and all these things, there's different tracks. So they call them tracks. So um, that's how basically information travels from your brain to your muscles and makes things work. And so that is, you know, different tracks and different things travel in different parts of the spinal cord. And so like you might get this, like this question on your test that it says, okay, this person had, you know, a fall, they had a fracture at C7 on the left side, and they can't move their right hand. Why is that? And so that's where you've got to know where these tracks are and how they run, and sometimes they cross different sides. And so, um, like, do you guys know what a stroke is? Okay. So a stroke is basically a brain injury. Part of your brain brain tissue dies, and so could be it's it's from lack of blood supply, but could be because there's a blood clot and won't let the blood flow through. Could be because there's a brain bleed and it's you know it's just bleeding out in the space. And so a lot of times, like if you, if you've seen people that maybe they're paralyzed on their right arm from having a stroke, 
the brain damage was actually on the left hand side more more times than not and that's because of how the different pathways cross through and you know inter innervate um, send the signal down to the muscles and, and things like that you brought some stuff yeah in. show us some stuff. all right okay where's where's the anatomy people who's in anatomy raise them up high so I can see all right who knows what this is get it man what is it <laughs> I get over here yeah it's a shoulder right so this is this is the humerus the clavicle the scapula right so this is a right shoulder this is kind of what it looks like so the clavicle doesn't stick out like that it's a little more like this but so these these represent ligaments this represents does anybody know what this represents right here see it biceps anybody know the biceps muscle how many heads does the biceps have two all right so that's the attachment of the long head it comes up and attaches does anybody know where it attaches Super, super glenoid, uh, yeah. Uh, something. Yeah, yeah I say this, the superior glenoid fossa. You know, it's right there on the top. So, um, rotator cuff muscles, there's four of them. There's three on the back, one on the front, okay? So all these, this would sit here. So, this is a shoulder. Everybody, did you guys know that already? Yeah, not as cool as I thought. But. It's all right. All right, so... Anybody know what this is? This is a foot, yeah. So, um, so I always think this is a cool model because it's got, can you see these red and blue markings on it? And so that's where different muscles attach. And so you can see in the foot, you know, this model alone has several different bones. And so the foot and the hand and the wrist, they're really complex and complicated to treat because there's so many different bones. Each bone has a different ligament that connects it to a different bone. There are different muscles that attach. And so the red and the blue spots, that's the origin and the insertion. So the origin is one attachment. The insertion is another attachment. So anybody want to see these? No? All right. Okay, so can anybody tell me what this guy is? The knee, yeah, all right. So this is actually, you might want to see this. So a healthy knee has cartilage at the end of the femur and at the end of the tibia. You know, you've got a meniscus in there, you've got some ligaments, the ACL, the PCL. So this is kind of a, the model shows, like when you get breakdown of your knee, so like arthritis or people say I'm bone on bone, this is kind of what it looks like. So it goes from two really smooth surfaces and when I say what it looks like, kind of, as you can see up here, like the color, not the color, but like what, what actually happens. So you can get flat spots where the cartilage would be or it gets rough. And so kind of the way I describe arthritis is, you know, you go from having two smooth surfaces moving over each other to two rough surfaces moving over each other. And so as that continues to wear away, um, it becomes problematic. So later on, um, you, you will learn, I don't know if it'll be in, in your class or not, but um, cartilage doesn't have a nerve supply and it doesn't have a blood supply. And so that's, it's, they call it avascular and aneural. So that's why cartilage doesn't regrow on its own. Like it just doesn't have the potential because there's no nutrients or things there to heal it. And so when people get arthritis and it's bone on bone, the pain actually comes from the ends of the bone rubbing on each other and not so much like the cartilage being worn away because if you have no nerve supply, there's no sensation to it. Make sense? So there's really nothing they can do, right? There's Except for joint replacement. Get a joint replacement. There are, so, like if you have like one spot that's an issue, they can do cartilage transplant, but if it's grossly like cartilage worn away, there's nothing they can really do about it. So. Um, usually they'll do those cartilage transplants in younger people. So like I, I would compare that to like a pothole in a road. You can fix a pothole, but you can't fix the whole road. So that's kind of the difference there. 
and then here's the spine. All right, so this is basically all the way from the occiput down to the pelvis. Um, you guys know what these little yellow things are? Nerves? <laughs> yeah, they're nerves. Um, and so each level in our spine has a nerve root that comes out. So they'll say C1, C2, C3, C4. Um, that corresponds to a level in the spine, okay? And so like I was telling you earlier, like if you're, you come into me and you tell me your hand is numb, like I, I have to think, could it be coming from up here in your neck? Because there's different, they call them dermatomes. And so dermatomes is different patterns of, of different nerve roots give sensation to different areas of the body. And so like um, C6 comes down to your thumb. C7 kind of comes more to the middle of your, like kind of your index finger or your middle finger. Um, C8 would be more like your pinky side. And so if you come in and say, Jeff, every time I wake up in the morning, my pinky's numb. That tells me it's probably a C8 problem or it's an ulnar nerve problem because that's the peripheral nerve. Um, and so that's when I was telling you about just the different pieces of the puzzle to figure out where are things coming from and why do they come, you know, in the patterns that they do. Kind of goes back to the basic things that you learn in like your anatomies and your, you know, your gross anatomy, that sort of thing. So another thing here, you guys see these little things? These represent discs. So you, it's called your intervertebral disc. And so what those serve as is basically spacers for the spine. So these, these holes for the nerve roots have enough room. So as people get older, they'll get what's called degenerative disc disease. And what happens is you get a hole for the nerve root that's supposed to be this big. And you know, I'm exaggerating, it's not really this big. But, so you lose the disc height and it all of a sudden becomes this big. And so you lose some space, you get pressure on a nerve, and that, that becomes an issue. So that's what the discs serve. I found this on the web. Oh, Siri. Sorry. Um, who could tell me what they think this red thing is? Any ideas? No? Herniated Yeah, it's a herniated disc, right? So you'll see, like, people who have a herniated disc, sometimes they'll get pain down their leg. Or if it happens in their neck, it might be down their arm, okay? So this disc presses out. And if you can see, it pushes, if it herniates in the right spot, puts pressure on the nerve and causes you pain, you know. So um, typically nerve symptoms, we think of shooting, burning, aching. Um, so you get people that, that pins and needles, they start describing their symptoms like that. That kind of leads you down, down a nerve path. So the other thing here is... Um, so your spinal cord, it ends at about L2, okay? So L2 in your back would be about right here, okay? So after that, all the nerves coming through here are peripheral nerves. And so when you have, if you have an issue with your brain or spinal cord, they'll call, the neurological symptoms, they'll group them into two classes. And so they'll be what they call upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron. So upper motor neuron is where the issue happens in your brain or your spinal cord. A lower motor neuron would be when it happens to the peripheral nerve. So like, have you guys ever heard of um, multiple sclerosis? Yeah, so you get some issues in the brain and spinal cord. That's an upper motor neuron. So you'll see they get these symptoms like spasticity, which is where... Um, like the muscles are really tight. You try to stretch them and they just lock on. Um, or you can, you can check what's called deep tendon reflexes. So like, has anybody ever been to the doctor and they've hit you in the knee with the reflex hammer? And your leg kicks out a little bit. So if there's an upper motor neuron issue, you know, a normal reflex might be this sort of thing. But if there's an upper motor neuron issue, it might, it might like shoot all the way out, okay? So, um, trying to think of what a peripheral nerve issue would be. So like a, a polio, you guys ever heard of polio? Okay, so polio is, that would be a lower motor neuron issue. And so like if they tapped your knee with a reflex hammer and you had polio, you wouldn't have any reflex because of the way these reflex arcs run. You know, they, 
they hit the tendon, there's a quick stretch and the signal goes all the way up to your brain and back down. And depending on what the issue is, maybe the signal doesn't get through. Like if there's a lower motor neuron issue with polio, you get no reflex. Or if there's an upper motor neuron issue, you get what they call hyperreflexia and you get this, you get a big kick. So that would be, you know, that's another thing that, that it's kind of cool you learn about when you see it the first time. You're like, oh, wow, that, that's it. Um, so, yeah. Any questions about spine? Anybody want to volunteer for one more, one more thing? You got to come up front. I'll do it. All right, come on up. All right. So one thing therapists do a lot is we work with people's balance and strength. Okay, so um, there's different ways we challenge balance. Do you think your balance is good? I think it's okay. It's okay. All right. So let me see you stand on one leg. You can even pick your leg. I'm gonna time you. See if you can go for 30 seconds. So there's there's different um, there's different systems that help us keep our balance. So we can see, like if you start to get off, your eyes tell your brain, hey, I'm leaning. I got to fix that. Um, there's kind of this inner ear apparatus. It's called your vestibular system. There's these little loops or or canals with fluid in them. That's good. All right. So now I want you to stand on this for 30 seconds. On one leg? Yeah. I didn't, were you doing pretty good? Sorry, stand on the right leg, same leg. Okay. You didn't wobble too much there, did you? All right. So the other thing that we do is, um, so you got the, the inner ear systems, you got your eyes, and then you've got kind of this feedback loop where you can feel with your feet, um, you know, the, the nerves, they tell your body. All right, that was 18 seconds. What'd you do to it? All right, so what this does, this is a foam pad. This is soft. It, oh, it's kind of slick there, too. So what happens, like, I let him keep his eyes open, so he's got one of the three, right? So he's got his vision. He's got this inner ear apparatus system, so he's got two out of three. And so when I do this, it kind of takes away some of the feedback you get. From feedback? Yep, so some of the sensation. So, and I was, like, I was overcorrecting myself yeah, a lot. Yeah, so, so as you start to move around... You, you really have to like, be aware of your, where your body is in space to correct and keep your balance. All right, I got one more thing. Here's the grand finale, all right? So stand on this. He made 18 seconds with his eyes open, all right? So stand on this. When you have your balance, close your eyes. <laughs> I lost it. Six seconds, all right? So what I did there is I, I took away two out of the three systems. So I took his eyes away. I took away his kind of sensation. So all he really had to focus on was this, this inner ear system. And so that's one out of the three. So sometimes people come in with balance issues, and we got to figure out, like, okay, is this, a, is this a sight issue? Like, are you falling all the time at night when you're trying to get up in the dark? Is this a – sorry, you can have a seat. Thanks for coming up. Um, he, do you have diabetes and have neuropathy and can't feel your feet? Is it that issue? Do you have an issue with your vestibular system where it's kind of like this inner ear apparatus? And so that's kind of what we tease out. To make things more difficult, most people have an issue with at least one or two of those at a time. So then you figure out, okay, we have two out of the three systems functioning properly. we got to make those two work really strong to compensate for this one that's not working very well. Can't really shut off the vestibular sensor. Can't shut off the vestibular sensor. That's good, though, probably. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I mean, he could at zero gravity, but yeah. he'd throw up a lot. But I heard of vertigo. Yeah. yeah. So vertigo is an issue, like, with your inner ear, that, that um, vestibular system where it's, you're getting, um, you're getting input that you're moving when you shouldn't be. So that's kind of a, that's another, another piece of it, but, so... Go ahead. Any other questions? Good. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Yeah. I appreciate it. Okay. I want to get one of those. No, no, no. It's called an Eric's pad. I hate it.